Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Vertical Church. I'm Pastor Randall, and it's my privilege today to be speaking to you this morning on Christmas. Oh, holy night. Listen, Pastor Ken and Kathy have, are taking some much needed time off um, this day, and it gives me the opportunity to be with you, and I'm so excited. I want to get right to the message, but first, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much this morning for allowing us to gather together in your name. God, be with us. Be amongst us. Let us feel your presence, Father God, either on this stage or in our living rooms or bedrooms or wherever anybody may be watching or listening. God, we give you all the glory. We thank you for this amazing opportunity, Father God, to know you, to be known by you, and to hear your word. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm super excited to be part of this series, this new series, Oh Holy Night. Pastor Ken introduced it to us last week and just preached the snot out of it. He was awesome. Um, so I'm a little bit intimidated, a little bit nervous, but, but listen, I, I, he gave me a really good topic. It's one of the verses of the song, actually, that says, The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. Kind of feels that way, doesn't it? Like a, a weary world. I don't know about you, but I think collectively, everybody I talk to just feels a little exhausted. I mean, after going through 2020 and feeling like, man, this has been a year that we've been like, man, it's felt like a decade, right? Just everything that we know, everything that's been familiar, being canceled, being postponed, being, being you know, rescheduled, or everything happening that used to happen in person, online. I'm tired. I'm weary from it. And even as we head into Christmas, I found myself feeling a little bit like, ugh, man, even Christmas is going to be different this year. So I want to talk to you about the perspective of how do we worship a holy God? How do we, how do we find the thrill and the hope of Jesus Christ during a weary season? So I'm going to tear with you a story that might not sound very Christmassy, but it's, it's Paul and Silas. And before we throw up the scriptures, I'm going to kind of set it up a little bit. So Paul and Silas are preaching. They're going out and talking to people and loving on people and healing the sick and preaching the word of God, right? And, and as they're going from town to town, they run into this woman who is eh, kind of a hype person, Okay. She's dancing before them and saying, hey, everybody, everybody, look, they're going to tell us how to be saved. They're going to tell us how to get to heaven. These guys are men of God. Kind of like not too authentic. You ever, have you ever experienced like a hype man that kind of feels like, yo, dude, I know when you're done calling my name, you're probably talking bad about me about my back, right? And Paul and Silas kind of catch on to this, 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 this idea that this woman isn't truly authentic. Like there's something funky about her, and it says in Scripture that he became annoyed with her. In fact, you know, as I read it the first time, I thought, well, that's nice. You know, they got a little game going up. She's setting the stage, preparing the atmosphere. But instead, they sent something in her, and he basically told her, shut up, casted a demon out of her. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I wish it was that easy for me sometimes. I'm kidding. But they, so this woman is all of a sudden transformed from this obnoxious, loud mouth, jumping around, drawing attention to herself rather than the father person into this docile, normal, released woman. Well, what happens is, is you think, well, that's good, right? Praise God she got healed from the very thing that was, was, was oppressing her. The very thing that was making her annoying in the sight of man. But what happened was is the people that owned her were selling her for these talents to be able to tell the future. They were prostituting this woman. And when they cast the demon out of her and they recognized that she was no longer who she used to be, they brought a campaign against Paul and Silas. So we're going to pick it up in Acts 16. Um, 22 through 26. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wood rods. Ouch. They were severely beaten. And when they were thrown into prison, the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chain of every prisoner was broken off. That's a pretty wild story, right? 
I, and I want to kind of just break down the scripture into a couple few um, simple points. That kind of, I'm going to walk it through and kind of relate it back to this, this story of Christmas positioned in, in, in a world right now that seems chaotic and exhausting and, and disillusioned, right? So let's go to the first point. The first point is heavenly perspective brings worldly opposition. Hmm. Can I get an Amen. I'm going to read the, the scripture again here, the 22 through 23. If you could just pull that back up for me. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Now that stinks, right? I mean, I've, I've felt sorry for myself before. I felt like a little bit condemned or hurt before, but I've never been stripped openly in public, beaten with rods severely, right? And, and, and the, next, the next verse says they were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. I don't know what that's about, but it seems to be that Christians had a reputation for getting out. Seems to me that the Christians had a, had a, a reputation for maybe escaping prison walls. I don't know. That's a whole other message. Okay, go to this next one. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. How many of you know that when you walk in the light of Jesus, things just look differently? I mean, the same situation can feel, sound, look, and inspire a completely different response regarding what place that you're getting your water from. I mean, if you're drinking from the hose and, and, and drinking city water here in West Haven, right, it's going to be a different taste than you're drinking from the eternal water that flows from the kingdom, right? The never-ending stream of living water that we have in Jesus Christ. And, 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 and when we walk in that, when we understand, it just gives us an advantage point, a vantage point that we can see things just a little bit differently. I mean, what it does is that it allows us to understand heavenly perspectives. It allows us to take normal everyday situations and see them through the eyes of a God who loves us. Sometimes that viewpoint, though, is a little bit skewed. Sometimes we as Christians get in our feels. Sometimes we feel a little bit higher above and we begin to condemn and judge. But what that vision is supposed to inspire is, is eyes to see the person and not the problem. Ears to hear the hurt and not the hate, right? What can happen, however, is we can forget that not everyone has the same perspective as we do, right? And we expect them to fit into our worldview, our understanding of, of heavenly things, of kingdom life, and, 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 and if they don't fit within that, we begin to judge them openly. Guys, this is not what God intended for us. This is not the way that we would be known. Jesus said, they will know you for the love that you show one another. He said, above all things, right? Love your Father. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And love people the same way. And how do we do that when we're, we're judging people? It's like, it's like taking a blind guy and putting him in a room and throwing some coffee tables around and say, run to the other side of the room. And then getting angry that he tripped over a coffee table that he could not see. I know that's a horrible illustration, and I've never done that, I swear. But, but this idea, right, that, that we expect people to have the perspective that we have because we are standing in Christ, we've been revealed, right, we've been opened up, our senses and our awareness is now of a kingdom reality, we're seeing things from a, from a kingdom perspective, and we place that judgment on people, expecting them to be in the same position that we are. Huh. So we must walk in spirit and truth and love. We have Christians uh, have a reputation for not being um, that graceful, for not loving, for not being compassionate. We've become known for our views rather than the love that we extend to each other. We build a high wall around ourselves, around our church, around our little communities that makes it nearly impossible, guys, for people to climb over and to fall into the grace that is so freely given in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The simplicity of the gospel has become nearly inapproachable when we allow ourselves to operate from a different place in love. So when we do try to operate of love, sometimes we can be understood, misunderstood. 
We can even feel like we're being persecuted. We can feel like victims or hurt or begin to choose to withdraw from ourselves, right? From, from our churches. We, uh, you know what? Uh, listen, I'm just going to go into my church. I'm just going to stay there because the people there are good. That's my church people. And, or this is my community over here. They all love Jesus. We do Bible study together. This is, my, this is the guy I go over and we worship together. Man, I don't need anybody else, right? I don't need anybody else. I know. I go to work. I just stay to myself. And we become these little islands. But that's not what we were called to be because what ultimately that is doing is saying I choose fear rather than faith. I choose, I, I choose division rather than inclusion. I, I, I separate. And Jesus is not a God of division. He's a God of multiplication. So we have to find ourselves positioned from our vantage point, looking into situations with heavenly eyes, with loving eyes. I love the scripture in Luke. Um, uh, Luke 12, it says, do not be afraid, little flock, because your father has been, has been delight in giving you the kingdom. Has been delight in giving you the kingdom. That, that, that doesn't sound right. But the, your father delights in giving you the kingdom, right? God gives us access to his viewpoint. God gives us access to his reality. God gives us access to his grace, to the abundance, and this idea of Holy Spirit who dwells within us, the living God, the third man of the Holy Trinity, dwelling inside of us, compelling us to love one another. And we can shut that off because of our own righteousness, our own insecurities, our own feels, our own hurts. So God tells us, don't be afraid. I've sent you something. I've given you this position of authority that needs to flow from a pit position or an atmosphere of love. The point, second point I want to make is point number two. We sing out from painful places. In verse 25, it says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And, and, and I, don't, I don't want you to make, I don't want to make you feel bad for being weary. Like, I don't want to make you be, feel bad for being tired. I don't want to make you bad because, you know, you're, you're not a bad person because you're upset that your guy didn't win, right? Or you're not upset, be, you know, you, you, we're allowed to feel these things. Actually, it's normal to grow weary. Defeated and even captured by the weight of, you know, the world sometimes. But it's vitally important that we don't remain in exhaustion, but instead we fix our focus on the one who is our source of strength, power, vigor, freshness. We have a reason to rejoice. It is a weary season. It's a difficult season, but we have a reason during this season, more than any other, to rejoice in the goodness and the gift of Jesus Christ. This idea of worshiping, Right? This idea of, of worshiping out of a place of hurt or pain is, is huge. It's huge. I, I, I look at the situation where Paul and Silas are in the, the, the inner dungeon. I've actually been um, in a dungeon in, in Rome. I took a tour um, last time I was there. And it's, it's not a friendly place, y'all. Of course, this dungeon that we were in is all swept up and mopped up and has spotlights in it. And you can go in there and the ceiling's a little low and you can walk around and say, wow, this is really scary. It smells weird in here and it's dark and it's dank and it's cold. And, but during the time that they were used as dungeons, the inner dungeon was the, the most horrible place to be in. It was the place where there was no light. Very little light, very little air, very little freshness came into that place. And there wasn't a guy with a mop. There was, there was prisoners who were shackled in these, in, 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 in these I guess, shackles, right? And, and what that was, guys, it wasn't, don't get to the point where you see little rings around their, their ankles and there's a chain to the floor. What they did is they would take a log, often two to 300 pounds, and, and bore out these holes in it. And they would put them really far apart. And they would put their legs in it so that their legs were spread like this. And then they would clamp this log over top of the legs and then chain it so that they couldn't move. They couldn't stand up. They couldn't bring their legs together to, to, to find rest. And, and, and you've got to imagine, now they were beaten with rods, severely beaten, the scripture tells us. There's wounds, that are, there's blood, there's, there's, there's flesh that is ripped, there's 
you know, ribs that are broken. I'm sure that there was a ton of damage done. And, and it wasn't only them. There was, it was full of prisoners who were beaten and broken. And, and dungeons were famous for the rats who would come in. And these guys couldn't move. So the, the rats would eat the flesh off of their legs and their feet. And, 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 and the muck. <laughs> and this is horrible. This is a bad picture. I don't want to ruin your, 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 your breakfast if you're eating breakfast with us. You might want to just push the Cheerios away for a minute. But, but the human waste in this place wasn't mopped up. You just sat in it. So you imagine the stench and the pain and the, and the bruising and the weariness and, and the rats and the yelling and the, and the chains clanging. And it's midnight and there's no light in this place. You're in this, this di- dingy, dark, cold place. And what do they do? Do they begin to weep for themselves? Begin to worship the Father. They find them in the self in, in a place of singing out from painful places. This is what we have to do, guys. We have to understand that even in our weary world, even in our, our, our fields, even when our stuff doesn't go our way, we have the opportunity and the responsibility, right, to bring our focus back to the Father, to celebrate our God with singing and praising. And the problem is, I find, is, is that sometimes we mistake our secret place of worship, our place of holy communion with Facebook, Right? Instagram, Twitter, etc. You may ask, well, hey, listen, how are prisoners going to know, Pastor, if I'm not telling everybody what is right, what is wrong, who is right, who is wrong, what's supposed to happen, and this is what God says, and all these different, how, how are they ever going to know? How are the prisoners around me going to hear? Uh, and I think that's a fair question. But I would say that worship has nothing to do with our opinion our political views, or our feelings. Neither is worship the slow song that the choir sings, right? It's, it's not volunteering in the children's area. It's not coming and serving food. And, and these are all aspects of worship. These are all outward displays of worship. But the worship that I'm talking about, the, the true worship that I'm ta- talking about, right, is, is one in particular that encapsulates the priority that we should give to worship as a spiritual discipline. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. True worship, in other words, is defined by the priority that we place on God in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities and how we display his love for others. The world's watching when things don't go our way. Our family is listening when we're hurt. Our coworkers are observing how we react when something unfair happens to us in the workplace. Right? Right? This is, this, is, this is the way that we're communicating. This is the way that we're radiating this light that's been given to us through this manger that was placed many years ago. And people are watching. Prisoners are listening. The best news about this season we're in is that God sent a son. And he sent his God to pay the price for the weight of our sin. He broke open the heavens and has given us a great hope. Right? A promise of, of relationship with our king. Joy that even in bad times never falters, never fails, never changes. Regardless of the situation, we can stand in the foundation of joy in knowing that God chose you and I. That Jesus came as a king, not fallen, but, but, but willingly to be born in a stinky manger, man. In a little baby body, Right? And live this extremely amazing life to show us, to display to us, what does love look like? What does love look like? What does, what does living with the priority of the Father first look like? And he did this, and he, and, he, and he died, and he rose again for what? So that those, you know, around us, when we come to the Christmas season, would understand that Christmas is so much more than gifts under the tree. It's so much more than, than, than anything that we could hope or imagine for. It is love personified. It is grace overwhelming. It is the condition of our hearts. Mm. I love this scripture um, in Zephaniah. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. 
I love that picture. I love that picture. You gotta understand as we begin to worship God, as we begin to offer our praises to God, as we live out this thing, this love that we've been given, we, we, we reflect the Father's heart to those around us. You see, Paul and Silas were singing. You gotta get in, again, the mind frame, the, the setting, the atmosphere of this, this tomb, this dark and dungy, uh, not tomb, but really kind of like a tomb, right? This dungeon and prisoners, shackled and laying on the floor and broken and beaten and starving and stinking and, and laying in their own muck, hopeless. And they're singing out to God. And as their, their worship reverberates down the halls of their influence, right? As the worship reverberates down the halls of their influence, he will exalt over you with loud singing. God matches God joins in the joyful chorus. God joins in the worship party. He, his voice, though, transforms the atmosphere that they're in. <laughs> Paul and Silas are caught up in this moment with the Father, and they're just worshiping him. They're forgetting about all the stuff that they're dealing with. They're not posting it on Facebook, on the injustice or on the fairness. They're, they're actually just said, Father, it's about you anyways. All we did was, was cast out a demon out of this woman and make her a better person. All we did was tell people about your Jesus. All we did was love people. And here we are, Father. And our only response to you is yes. <laughs> and see, when God sings with us, when God enters the atmosphere, when God's worship breaks through, chains break off. What happens is, is it, we just have to pick it up. We have to pick it up in, in, on my third point which says personal earthquakes break chains. Verse 26 says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Come on. I mean, come on. How many of us want that kind of faith that breaks the chains of all that we encounter? How many of us want God within us to have his way and bring all to his marvelous grace and light? This is the thrill of hope. This is the thrill of hope. This is the joy of Christmas. This is the evidence. This is the evidence of our understanding who Jesus was and what he came to do and what he came to purchase on our behalf. That the love and the light of Jesus in us would shine brighter. Come on. How many of you know that the love of Jesus needs to shine brighter than our, than our screens? Then our media sources, then social media and everybody's opinion and, and all these different things that, that if we could just remember who our priority is, if we could just remember the baby that was born in the manger that bought with his own life a perfect relationship with the one, man, and only God. I tell you guys, I... I hope that, that this is the reality that we can exercise in this Christmas. <clears throat> that in that manger so many years ago laid a deposit of heaven. A deposit of heaven that was greater in the answer to sickness, the answer to death, the answer to hate, the answer to, to political unrest, the answer to all these things. The solution for all that's broken, the very definition of love itself was born unto us. I love this verse in Romans 15 that says, um, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and faith so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 15, 13. Where are you at? Where are you at? Are you wrapped up in the thrill of the hope of the gospel? Are you wrapped up in the thrill of knowing Jesus? Are you wrapped up in the understanding that he was born on our behalf? Are you wrapped up in the fact that God chose you despite, man, well, just despite, right? I wanna, I wanna take it a, an opportunity right now to talk about what Jesus did after the manger. <laughs> and after he became an adolescent, after he walked with the disciples and performed miracles and healed all that came unto him. 
after he, he, he was crucified on our behalf and took the weight of all sin and shame and darkness upon his own shoulders. After the fact that his, his blood and his body and the oxygen eventually ran out and he died on that rugged cross with nails in his palms and in his ankles. I want to talk to you about the fact that he went to the grave and not only did he, that, oh, did he, did he take death, but he conquered it. <laughs> and on the third day, he rose again. And then he walked around for another 40 days, y'all. He, he did communion with, with his boys, with the disciples. He, he preached. He, he, he modeled. He breathed the Holy Spirit in, into the lives of those to calm them down. But there was this thing where he was, he was leaving them again. And all the disciples are gathered around. And they said, Jesus, no. Please don't leave us again. The three days was too much to bear. And he turns to them and says, listen, I, I, I got to go. I got to go because I'm going to send you something far better than myself. How could that be? How could there be anything more precious than the Savior of the world? God in a, in a little baby body, right, that, that took on the weight of all of our junk and he said, I'm, I'm leaving you somebody who will become your counselor, your mentor, your, your voice of reason, your power, your passion. This, and I'm talking about the person of the Holy Spirit that was deposited in us when we first accept Jesus Christ. The one who convicts those who are far from God, not us. We're not to judge. We're, we're meant to love. We're meant to express the joy of the manger. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to celebrate the victory of the cross in a way that displays an open arms and leave the, leave the transformation to the one who does the transforming. So I just want to pray for you right now. I want to invite you, no matter where you are, if you're sitting in your room right now, if you're in bed still, or you're sitting at the coffee table, or you're sitting at the kitchen table, if you're at your office watching this later in the week, listen, I want you to just, I want you to take that junk, the anger, the fear, the weariness, the heaviness, and I want you to, I just want you to mentally just put it out and put it before you, and I want you to just make yourself quiet right now with me, and get in a position of receiving. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come right now, Holy Spirit, come. Come into the atmospheres of those who are watching, those who are engaging right now, Father God, and transform them with the love of Jesus Christ right now. Oh, Father, give us heavenly perspective that we might position ourselves to receive you, to, to be more of you, to drink from the, from the water of life, Father God, to, to shine a light that is brighter than the negativity and the hate and the vitriol. Father God, forgive us, Lord, for the things that we have become as, 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 as we've tried to navigate the brokenness in this world and tried to fix it on our own or tried to call these things out on our own judgment, Father God and have pushed aside the Holy Spirit who is to do the job in and through us, Father God, but always, always from a position of love. If you're with me still, I just ask you to just, even, even it might feel weird, just if you can, just put your hands like this. It's a position, it's a, it's a, it's a position that we see even etched on, 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 ancient graves and ancient um, gathering spaces, the early Christian church where we see people with their hands Lift it up and worship to the Father. This, this, this act of submission, this act of, yes, God, I surrender to you, right? This, this positioning that we find ourselves in when we understand the value, the joy of Jesus Christ. So I just ask you, just open up your hands, release that stuff and say, Father, come. Father, come. Father, God, allow this season to be one of great joy. Extend me, Father God, to be an atmosphere <laughs> that is rich with your presence. Father God, don't let me forget that I, too, am one of your children. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, right now, for those who are sick, to begin to heal them right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to, to take those who are stuck in depression. And I, can, I command depression to leave in the name of Jesus Christ and the blood that was spilled. I thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, Father. 
as we celebrate his birth this season, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just be present, ever present, pouring out your love, your understanding, your grace. For those who are weary, refresh. For those who are hurting, Father God, healing. For those who are depressed, Father God, joy, joy, supernatural joy. Oh, Father God, you are so good. And if you have it in you, just say more, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Invade my place. Invade my living room. Invade my kitchen. Help me to know you more. Help me to find the freedom that you promised through this gift of Jesus Christ. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.